the world was at war. And it was time for the next new engine technology to change the world. Enter the jet. The jet engine is a gas turbine where you throw the exhaust gases fast out the back end to provide thrust. And the compressor and turbine of the gas turbine do the compressing to give you the high flow you need to throw out and the turbine provides the work to drive the compressor and what's left is what you use for thrust. Imagine if you're baking cookies. Imagine if you bake the cookies one at a time, you put a, some dough on a tray, you shove it into the oven, you wait for it to bake, and then you pull it out. That's what we do in the internal combustion engine with the reciprocating piston. We put the fuel or mixture in, stop. We compress it, stop, burn it, expand it, stop, push it out, stop. It's constantly stop, start, stop, start. Whereas with the jet engine, it's basically like a continuous process. Imagine putting all your cookie dough on a conveyor belt and running it through an oven. It all started about 60 years ago, when Britain and Germany were racing to develop the first ever jet aircraft. In 1941, Germany was the first into the air, with a fighter prototype, the HE-280. A year later, the Germans had an even better jet fighter, the ME-262. And that was the world's first jet plane to go into mass production. Britain's first jet, the Gloucester Meteor twin-engine fighter, had its first test flight in March of 1943. From there, we've come all the way to this. Airbus Industries is developing what some are calling the Super Jumbo. It's a double-decker plane that's 50% bigger than a Boeing 747, and it's capable of carrying six or 700 passengers. In the early days of their development, rocket engines and jet engines were closely related, and people made little distinction between them. A rocket is similar to a jet, except that it carries its own supply of oxygen to create combustion. Jets get their oxygen from the air. Rockets get it from the oxygen tank they carry on board. That means a rocket can fly in space where there is no oxygen. Robert Goddard's rocket experiments in the United States in the early 1930s were followed by Werner von Braun's rocket experiments in Nazi Germany, which led to the V-2 rockets which rained down on Britain during World War II. We knew that uh, we had created a new means of warfare. The rocket technology pioneered by Goddard and von Braun enabled future developments like the breaking of the sound barrier by Chuck Yeager in 1947 the launch by the USSR of Sputnik in 1957, and the Apollo 11 landing on the moon in 1969. Today, the three main rocket engines that power the space shuttle produce thrust equivalent to 37 million horsepower. That's as much as 23 Hoover dams. Together, the engines consume 64,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen fuel per minute. The engines are movable and are used to steer the shuttle during flights. They also provide additional thrust for launch, supplementing the two huge booster rockets, which are jettisoned after takeoff. For decades now, advancements in the world of engine technology have led to bigger engines. But one of the most exciting areas today involves creating tiny engines that can fit on the tip of your finger. Microtechnology is a fast-growing area of research that has grown out of the miniaturization of electronic components. Some of the same manufacturing techniques are being used to build microtechnology engines. There are actually advantages to making things small. As you miniaturize something, the weight goes down as the, as the third power of the dimension, but the propulsive force goes down as the second power of the dimension. So as it gets smaller, the actual propulsion to weight goes up. Professor Martin Schmidt of MIT has developed a turbojet engine the size of a postage stamp. And why did he want to do that? Well, first, it's awful fun. <laughs> uh, second, uh, there's uh, propulsion applications, um, miniature aircraft, uh, miniature satellites. Professor Schmidt's tiny turbojet engine works exactly like the ones on a Boeing 747. This would be a turbine engine uh, where air would come in through the center hole and then uh, fuel would be injected through a variety of these ports located here. And the air and fuel would mix after going across a compressor, enter a uh, combustion volume that's 
in, the cir- in a circular region that surrounds this and then go across a set of turbine blades and be exhausted out through this port here. And inside of that lamination is this little disk. And that's a disk that will spin at one and a half million RPM. Scientists at MIT believe this engine might power a tiny airplane with a wingspan of about three inches. Hundreds of such inexpensive disposable microjet airplanes could be used for surveillance by the military or for weather exploration. Another application scientists have great hopes for is the use of these tiny engines to generate electricity so they could replace the heavy and less efficient battery packs and things like laptop computers. Some scientists are working on new micro-engine concepts that don't even exist at larger scales. But again, the target device is about shirt button size, and we hope we'll generate about 50 milliwatts, which is enough to drive uh, your cell phone or a uh, personal organizer. You put a few of these together, you could drive your laptop computer. If we take a fuel air mixture, bring it into the center of a spiral heat exchanger like this, burn the fuel air mixture in the middle, and then as the combustion products go out, use those outgoing products to preheat the fuel air mixture that's coming in, you can actually get combustion under other situations that otherwise the, the flame would extinguish. If we put devices called thermoelectric materials in these walls, we can actually use that to generate electrical power. Some microtechnology engines have gears the size of a grain of pollen and gear teeth the size of a red blood cell. If you want to make a microtechnology engine look big, just put it beside a nanotechnology motor. Nanomachines are so small you can't even see them under a microscope. Nano means a billionth. So things that are a billionth of a meter would be nanometer, which is what is often discussed. Line up ten atoms in a row, and that row will be about one nanometer long. The roots of nanotechnology can be traced all the way back to 1959, when the late scientist Richard Feynman gave a legendary talk at the California Institute of Technology. It was entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. If we go down far enough, all of our devices can be mass-produced so that they are absolutely perfect copies of one another. I want to build a billion tiny factories, models of each other, which are manufacturing simultaneously, drilling holes, stamping parts, and so on. The issue was making things smaller and smaller, and that he didn't see any major violations of the basic physical laws, like the laws of thermodynamics, if you made something really small. It is my intention to offer a prize of $1,000 to the first guy who makes an operating electric motor which is only one sixty-fourth inch cubed. The prize was claimed years ago, but Professor Ross Kelly of Boston College wanted to go beyond Feynman's challenge of one sixty-fourth inch cubed. Coming up with a molecule, which is much, much smaller than that, is sort of the ultimate answer to his challenge. And so it's taken us another forty years to get down to the, the, the smallest possible scale. Professor Kelly succeeded in arranging 78 atoms to create a motor that consists of one single custom-built molecule. The original design, of course much smaller than this, had two parts, something that was going to rotate that looks like a gear, has three blades on it, and something else that was going to function like the pawl on a ratchet. And it was supposed to rotate like this. Each corner represents a carbon atom with a hydrogen atom on it. It's connected to the next corner by a bond between two carbon atoms. The next corner, another bond between two carbon atoms. And because of the laws of chemistry, one can predict how long the distances are going to be and what the geometries are going to be. In other words, even though it's so tiny he can't actually see it, Kelly knows he's created a single molecule whose atoms function like a motor. It took him four years to develop his motor molecule. But now it can be produced in batches, large batches. Yeah, we had a flask with something like 10 to the 20th, approximately a billion, billion molecular motors in it. You could make as many as you want, trillions and trillions and trillions. I think this will have an enormous impact. Being able to manipulate things at the micro and nano level enable us, us to build a nearly limitless number of, of devices and systems. And those devices and systems will have certainly as many applications as the uh, 
as the devices we built uh, during the Industrial Revolution did. Up next, cars that combine the best of two worlds. Hybrids powered by both a gas engine and an electric motor. In 2001, the U.S. government launched the National Nanotechnology Initiative with an annual budget of nearly $500 million. Engines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to engines on Modern Marvels. Hybrids, seen by some as the way of the future for automobiles, are propelled by both a gasoline engine and an electric motor. In hybrids like the Prius, introduced by Toyota in 1997, the engine and the motor can propel the car either separately or together. To reduce emissions, the electric motor is used to take the vehicle up to about 15 miles per hour, and then the gas engine takes over. Electric cars put out no pollution, but the problem is they have to be charged up constantly. Hybrids offer some of the advantages of the electric car, except you never have to plug it in at a recharging station. That's because hybrids charge up their own batteries while they're moving. It's actually regenning and putting energy from the tire through the motor back into the battery pack. With regenerative braking, the car slows down by using its electric motor as a generator. This creates drag on the driveline and charges the battery. In other words, by functioning as a brake, the electric motor generator actually creates energy instead of wasting energy and heat loss like a regular brake. As we turn the corner here, initial acceleration is uh, motor, and as I step into the throttle, the engine starts. Green is charge, red is power. As I lift off the throttle, engine shuts off, the energy flow is from the tires through the motor back into the battery pack. Toyota's competitor Honda began selling its two-seater hybrid called the Insight in 2000. Both cars sell for around $20,000. In Japan, over 34,000 hybrids have been sold since 1997. They're more expensive because you've got a battery and a motor to add to the engine that you're already paying for. And the benefits depend on the kind of driving these vehicles go through. So, for example, in Japan, they roughly double the fuel economy because it's very congested, slow speed driving, lots of stopping and starting. When we come to the kind of driving we have in North America, less congested, we drive at higher speeds, uh, longer distances, then the hybrid's not as attractive. Trains have been using the hybrid concept for years. The locomotives we call diesels are really diesel electric, with a powerful diesel engine generating electricity for the electric motors that turn the wheels. But the hybrid isn't the only bright hope on the horizon for automobiles. There is also hydrogen. In 2000, BMW came out with the world's first production car run on either hydrogen or gasoline. When the car is switched over to run on hydrogen, it's like turning off the pollution. The only thing coming out of the exhaust pipe now is water vapor. But hydrogen comes at a price. The critical question is then, all right, if you want hydrogen, where do you get it from? Well, the most economic way now is to make hydrogen from natural gas. Natural gas has got carbon in it, so in producing hydrogen, we release the carbon into the atmosphere. That doesn't really help with the greenhouse gas problem. If we made hydrogen from nuclear power or perhaps uh, solar energies, maybe we could find a, an economic way to do that that would let us produce hydrogen without releasing any carbon dioxide. From steam engines to Stirling engines, from pistons to turbines, tracking the history of engine technology is a rewarding pilgrimage. A journey through a noble pantheon of man's greatest technological achievements. Ever since Hero built his first steam engine in ancient Greece, humans have been fascinated by the latest engines and motors. I did it because I thought it would be neat, mostly, and I wasn't terribly worried about applications. Undoubtedly, that fascination will keep us connected